I'm the only survivor. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're examining 20 people who survived attacks by some of the world's most famous killers. At the beginning, I did think I was going to die. Donette Wilt survived Christopher Wilder. The beauty queen killer embarked on a cross-country killing trip in early 1984, abducting at least 12 women and killing eight of them. Wilder eventually made his way onto the FBI's 10 Most Wanted list, and it was while he was on it that he abducted Donette Wilt. When they reached his car, Wilder drew his pistol and forced Donette to get in. Wilt was at the South Lake Mall in Merrillville, Indiana, when she was kidnapped by Wilder and sexually assaulted. After making their way into New York, Wilder took Wilt to a secluded area, stabbed her twice, and left her for dead. As he began to drive away, the fear that Donette Wilt might still be alive seized him. Luckily, Wilt was resourceful and survived the attack, eventually making her way to the road and flagging down a truck driver. He took her to a nearby hospital, and she survived after receiving life-saving surgery. Thanks to Wilt's testimony, the FBI now pinned Wilder in the Northeast, still driving the Mercury Cougar he had stolen from Terry Walden. Felicity Nightingale survived Fred West. One of England's most notorious serial killers, Fred West killed at least 12 women, including his own daughter, Heather. So now you can see that they slowly but surely crafted this into a refined, scavenging, predatory, stalking, family a sort of unit that could, as it were, take people off the streets very, very efficiently. In April of 1980, after West had already killed most of his victims, he picked up a hitchhiker named Felicity Nightingale. After deriding her for hitchhiking, West invited her to stay the night with his family, claiming that it would be dark soon. Luckily, she refused, but her defensive behavior caused West to grow irate. Despite his explosive temper, he eventually let Nightingale out of the car, and she made her way home by other means. Later, when reading about West's crimes in the paper, she noticed that he was the man that gave her a ride all those years ago. On the morning of the 24th of February, 1994, a police search team knocked at the door of 25 Cromwell Street and set in motion an investigation that would stun the world. The murderous career of Fred West was about to come to an end. Cindy Paulson survived Robert Hansen. Robert Hansen is thought to have kidnapped women, taken them into the Alaskan wilderness, and hunted them with an automatic rifle. He killed at least 17 women throughout the 70s and early 80s. But he was finally caught thanks to the efforts of one Cindy Paulson. We found her in handcuffs with uh, very little clothes on. She was real credible. She was very scared, she was very frightened, and uh, she told us her story. Hansen had kidnapped Paulson and claimed he was taking her to his remote cabin presumably to hunt and kill her. But while Hansen was distracted loading his plane with supplies, Paulson escaped and ran for it, eventually reaching the safety of a passing truck. She was later interviewed by police and testified against Hansen. With her testimony, police were able to secure a warrant and search Hansen's property, which eventually led to his arrest. The interrogation room was ready for him. The goal was to keep him off balance, hoping to elicit a confession and avoid a lengthy legal case. Carl Stodder survived Dennis Nielsen. Scottish killer Dennis Nielsen was active between 1978 and 1983, killing between 12 and 15 young men. In May of 1982, he picked up 21-year-old Carl Stodder at a Camden pub. But when he crossed paths with Nielsen in May 1982, Nielsen had already murdered 13 young men. And in fact, Carl would be one of the few to make it out of his flat alive. Nielsen took Stodder home, where he proceeded to pass out. When he awoke, he was being drowned in Nielsen's bathtub. But Stoddard survived, and Nielsen nursed him back to health. Nielsen told Stoddard that he had suffocated in his sleeping bag and that he put him in the bath to resuscitate him. He then took Stoddard to the train station and simply let him go. I said, well, why didn't you go to the police? And he said, I did go to the police. He said, I went down, he said, and they brushed it off as a lover's tiff. Later, after Nielsen was convicted, Stoddard asked him why he was spared. Nielsen simply replied, quote, what passed between us was a thin strand of humanity. Christopher Bryson survived Robert Berdella. On March 29, 1988, Robert Berdella of Kansas City kidnapped a 22-year-old man named Christopher Bryson. Christopher Bryson was wandering the streets when Robert Berdella picks him up and he offers him a beer and they, they drive around in his car for a while. Berdella then says, well, come back to my house and you can have a beer there. So Christopher agrees and they go back. By this point, Berdella had already killed at least six young men. 
Bryson was taken to Berdella's home, tied to a bed and subjected to sexual abuse for multiple days. After four days in captivity, Bryson freed himself while Berdella was at work and fled the house, catching the attention of a nearby man. The police were called, Bryson was rescued, and a search warrant was issued for Berdella's home. Unknown to the police, they were about to uncover the shocking crimes committed by a sadistic serial killer, Robert Berdella. And with that, his crime spree finally came to an end after four long years. Cynthia Vigil survived David Parker Ray. Terrorizing the American Southwest for many years, David Parker Ray is also known as the Toy Box Killer. He was a predator, and he was a very good one, a very intelligent one. The name comes from his semi-trailer, The Toy Box, inside of which Ray would conduct most of his heinous crimes. While Ray was never convicted of murder, he is suspected of killing more than 60 people. Cynthia V. Hill was kidnapped by Ray and kept inside the toy box for three days before freeing herself and escaping. Her getaway was noticed by Ray's accomplice, Cindy Hendy, who gave chase. A fight ensued, and V. Hill managed to grab an ice pick and stab Hendy in the neck. When she grabbed her head, that's I just jumped. I dropped the phone and I jumped from the bed to the living room floor and just bolted out the door. For the first time in days, Cynthia is outside and free. She then made her way to a nearby home and called the police, resulting in the downfall of the toy box killer. Lisa McVeigh survived Bobby Joe Long. Sometimes people escape killers. Other times, the killers let them go. That's the case with serial killer Bobby Joe Long and Lisa McVeigh, who would have been his ninth confirmed murder victim. Bobby Joe Long killed at least 10 women in Tampa, and on November the 3rd, 1984, he tried adding one more to his macabre list. On November 3rd, 1984, Long kidnapped McVeigh as she was riding her bike and took her to his house, where he subjected her to sexual assault. But McVeigh managed to bond with Long and eventually convinced him to let her go. At one point, she told him she had to care for her sick father. Finally, after 26 hours, he dropped her off not far from where the ordeal began. He blindfolded her, took her to the woods, and fled. McVeigh made her way home and phoned the police, and they began the surveillance on Long, which eventually led to his arrest. McVeigh later became a police officer and was present when Long was executed in 2019. Jeffrey Rignall survived John Wayne Gacy. While some people physically survive their attackers, the pain never truly goes away. On March 21st, 1978, 26-year-old Jeffrey Rignall was attacked by John Wayne Gacy, who lured Rignall to his car with the promise of a joint. Gacy goes on the hunt and finds Jeffrey Rignall. The killer lures him into his car with me. He was chloroformed and taken to Gacy's house, where he was subjected to horrific abuse. After a while, Rignall fell unconscious and awoke in Lincoln Park, with Gacy having let him go. Gacy never explained why he let Rignall escape. Rignall spots Gacy's car, and he follows it to Gacy's home. From there, he gets the license plate and reports it to the police, and the police issue a warrant. Regardless, the incident had a profound effect on Rignall, who soon suffered from depression, became withdrawn and reclusive, and lost a large amount of weight. He penned a memoir titled 29 Below before dying in 2000 at the age of 49. Carol Duranch survived Ted Bundy. Carol Duranch was at a mall in Murray, Utah when she was approached by one officer, Rosalind, who informed her that someone had tried breaking into her car. A man approached me. He said he was a police officer. And he said, well, we found someone trying to break into your car. He was polite. He asked me if I wanted to come out to the car with him and see if anything was missing. He offered to drive her to the police station and file a report, and she agreed. But when she pointed out that he was driving in the wrong direction, he pulled over, attacked, and attempted to put her in handcuffs. She fought off her attacker and escaped, later identifying him in a police lineup. It was Ted Bundy, and he was sentenced to prison. I just think he thought he was gonna get away with that. Unfortunately, he later escaped and continued his infamous reign of murder. Another survivor of Bundy's is Rhonda Stapley, a college student who was sexually assaulted before fleeing into the nearby woods. Tracy Edwards survived Jeffrey Dahmer. If it wasn't for Tracy Edwards, then Jeffrey Dahmer might never have been caught. 
On July 22, 1991, Dahmer attracted the attention of Edwards and invited him back to his apartment. And Jeffrey said, well, let's come up to the apartment. We have a beer about time, everything. She might be back. We drink a beer or two, you know. While there, Dahmer displayed some horrifying behavior, like holding a knife on Edwards and saying that he was going to eat his heart. Edwards eventually punched Dahmer in the face and ran out of the building, finding nearby police officers Robert Ralph and Rolf Mueller. They accompanied Edwards back to the apartment and immediately found evidence of Dahmer's crimes. After a brief struggle, Dahmer was handcuffed and arrested. His infamous death toll finished at 17. Edwards told police about Dahmer ending Dahmer's killing spree. Former District Attorney Michael McCann says Edwards deserves the credit for finally exposing Dahmer and his crimes. Had that not happened, had Edwards uh, himself been slain, no one could tell how many more people might have been killed. Holly Dunn survived and held Resendiv. Resendiv went by the name of the Railroad Killer, a man who claimed at least 15 lives throughout Mexico and the United States during the 80s and 90s. On August 29, 1997, Resendiv attacked both Christopher Meyer and his girlfriend Holly Dunn, who were walking alongside some train tracks. He tied both of them up and killed Meyer by dropping a large rock on his head. I got my hands untied. I held onto my belt behind my back so it looked like I was still tied up. He proceeded to stab Dunn in the neck with an ice pick, beat her over the head with a plank of wood, and sexually assault her. She managed to survive her injuries, becoming the only known victim of the railroad killer to have done so. Rose Stewart survived Dean Carter. In March of 1984, Dean Carter murdered five women and received the death penalty for his crimes. However, his first attempt at murder was not successful. Rose Stewart, a woman whom Carter had known and grown attached to, woke up to find him in her room, whereupon he had his way with her for five hours. However, Stewart pretended to enjoy his company. Due to the compassion she showed him, he let her live, and she promised to call him while he was leaving. Stewart quickly went to the authorities, but Carter was long gone. Stewart later testified against Carter in court, helping to put him behind bars. Teresa Thornhill survived Robert Black. Throughout the 1980s, Robert Black kidnapped, assaulted, and murdered numerous young girls throughout the United Kingdom. Teenage Teresa Thornhill was almost added to his body count when she was grabbed by Black on the streets of Nottingham. However, she managed to squeeze his groin during the struggle, which in turn loosened his grip and allowed her to scream for help. Her nearby boyfriend heard her screams and raced to her aid, resulting in Black hopping back into his car and speeding away. I feel like I'm happy to be here and I'm like happy to, that I've survived the tale. Another two years passed before Black was apprehended in Scotland. He was sentenced to life in prison where he died in 2016. Tali Shapiro survived Rodney Alcala. No one knows how many lives Rodney Alcala ended. Some say it could be 50, others say it could be as high as 130. <laughs> Between takes, he might find him skydiving or motorcycling. Please welcome Rodney Alcala. Rod, welcome. Known as the dating game killer because he once appeared on the game show before his crimes were known, he was sentenced to death in 2010 for five murders and received an additional 25 years after copping to two others. His spree began in 1968 with the young Tali Shapiro, whom he sexually assaulted and beat in his apartment. After responding to a 911 call, a police officer found the bloodied Shapiro, but Alcala had fled. Shapiro survived the ordeal and now works as a chef. Why in the world are there so many other victims when it was a known fact of what he did to me? Larry Flint survived Joseph Paul Franklin. Larry Flint, the president of Larry Flint Publications and the producer of Hustler magazine, also had an encounter with a serial killer. On March 6, 1978, Flint and his lawyer were shot by a man who was standing across the street from them. Years later, white supremacist Joseph Paul Franklin, who had slain between 7 and 22 people throughout the late 70s, claimed responsibility. Franklin stated that he was upset by interracial photos that were featured in Hustler. He supposedly had uh, shot me over a black and white photo feature that we had published in a magazine. While Flint survived the attack, his spine was irreparably damaged, leaving him permanently paralyzed and dependent on medications. Number five, Corazon Amurao survived Richard Speck. While Speck's reign of terror lasted only one night, it is harrowing all the same. On the night of July 13th to 14th, 1966, Speck broke into a dormitory that housed student nurses, and it was here that he assaulted and murdered eight of its occupants. Amorau could have been the ninth victim, but she hid under a bed while Speck was finishing off the other eight women. She stayed under the bed until 6 a.m., 
when she finally emerged amid the blood and bodies. Amoral later identified Speck in court, a move that helped sentence him to life in prison. It was there he died from a heart attack in 1991. Kathy Kleiner and Karen Chandler survived Ted Bundy. Bundy has already appeared on this list. The man who killed 30-plus people almost added two more to his list on the morning of January 15, 1978, when he broke into a Florida State University sorority house. After bludgeoning one woman with a fire log and strangling another, he attacked Kleiner and Chandler. And he had a log, a log, a piece of firewood that he had picked up, and he struck me in the head with it. Kleiner suffered a broken jaw and a lacerated shoulder, while Chandler suffered a concussion, a crushed finger, a broken jaw, and some lost teeth. Bundy's attacks on all four women lasted all of 15 minutes. Had he stayed longer, there's no telling how many more would have suffered. Whitney Bennett survived Richard Ramirez. Known as the Night Stalker, this monster burgled many homes and murdered at least 13 people in California from June 1984 to August 1985. He almost added teen Whitney Bennett to his list, and among Ramirez's survivors, her story is perhaps the most perplexing. Bennett was beaten with a tire iron and strangled with a telephone cord. However, Ramirez saw sparks shoot from the cord, and when Bennett took a breath, he was frightened and ran away. Ramirez was a Satanist, and he believed this was a sign that Jesus Christ had saved his victim, hence his fear. He left Bennett alive, but with massive lacerations to her scalp that required 478 stitches to close. Brian Hartnell survived the Zodiac Killer. The Zodiac Killer is one of the most infamous serial killers of all time, and perhaps his most well-known attack was the one at Lake Berryessa. On the afternoon of September 27, 1969, Brian Hartnell and his girlfriend Cecilia Shepard were having a picnic at Lake Berryessa. It wasn't long before the Zodiac, complete with an executioner's hood, appeared. The couple was tied up, and the Zodiac proceeded to stab them numerous times while they were on the ground. You have to have a, a successful yes. set of goals. And if you can keep this going, and you can keep your mind active, you, I don't, uh, whether you die or not, you're at least psychologically uh, attuned. Hartnell survived his wounds and later told his story to the authorities. However, it was in vain. The Zodiac Killer was never caught. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Rebecca Garde survived Gary Ridgway. Known as the Green River Killer, Ridgway's 49 confirmed murders make him the most prolific serial killer in American history and unconfirmed murders could bring the total higher than 90. He's a waste of society and a waste of space. Garde was almost added to the tally when she was picked up by Ridgeway while hitchhiking along the Pacific Highway. After offering to perform an intimate service on Ridgeway, she was taken into the woods where Ridgeway attacked her. She managed to fight him off and ran to a nearby trailer home, where she was quickly taken in and sheltered. While she could barely speak immediately after the attack, she survived and is extremely lucky to have done so. He has beat the system just like he beat his victims. I know he will burn in hell because you can't be God. Have you ever had a run-in with a shady figure? Let us know in the comments below. I said, well, I'm gonna have to do something now. Either he's gonna kill me anyway, so I might as well at least die trying. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.